And first, I'd like to introduce uh, Ron Plain, who some of you saw us speak last night. Ron is a member of the Amjunang First Nation, and he's helped his people wage a 30-year struggle against the damaging effects of industry pollution. He's faced attacks from CN Rail and for his role um, in I Don't Know More as the blockade. So we welcome Ron and our prayers and worship. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to shorten up a bit what I was going to say, only because yesterday we went over, all of us went over, and we didn't have the time for discussion. I'm sure most of you know uh, some of the story about me. I want to talk about uh, my life, I guess. My family, uh, <coughs> I don't know, Fred Plain, and Fred uh, was the original Indian activist. In the 40s and 50s, he was very active. Uh, in the early 60s, the Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which he helped found, uh, created a passport for him on Birchbark, and he flew around the world with that passport. <laughs> and when he landed at Maribel, um, back then airport security was a cement wall about that high between this deep, or deep plane, as they call it, I guess, and, and uh, the crowd. And uh, Uncle Fred came off the plane from Switzerland, and by then, um, the newspapers in Canada had heard of this Indian traveling around Europe on a birch bark passport. So they were all there. The Toronto Star, the Morgan Mail, all the existing papers of the day, television of the day. And my uncle Fred had a booming voice, a really powerful voice. And uh, you could hear him scream, well, where the hell are you going to deport me to then? <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let him back into Canada with his passport on you know, birch bark. He physically, foot to ass, kicked John Gretchen in the ass when John Gretchen was Minister of Indian Affairs. And, you know, <laughs> his dad, my dad's dad, my grandfather, was the last hereditary chief of Bombshanong. He was also the first elected chief of Bombshanong. And he um, did some stuff in the early 1900s that uh, inspire me today. Um, it, the, the surveillance on Indian leaders at the time is no different than it is today. I know absolutely that I'm being tracked by CSIS and by the RCMP everywhere I go. Uh, in the CN fight, my entire Facebook account was submitted as evidence by CN. Um, back then it was a little stricter because you had Indian agents and, and laws against you for meeting for traditional businesses. So my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and, and my grandfather devised his plan with a family named the Pamps of Michigan. Um, and so they went around the Great Lakes and they got all these Indian leaders to become religious people. They all became preachers. And they traveled the Great Lakes from Indian community to Indian community to Indian community. And they stood in front of the, the, the uh, churchgoers uh, preaching as they're supposed to. And then afterwards, they'd meet with the underground of that community to keep the communication flowing. And the nerve and, and, and the forethought to be able to put this together was just amazing. Because of what they did, a lot of our ceremonies stay today. And some of our languages still remain today. They took me to rallies. My dad came with us. My dad died much too young to ever really establish himself as an activist. He was hardcore. He was a union guy. Uh, and that's where he directed his activism when Dow Chemical killed him with cancer. So I do what I do in memory of my dad because I know uh, he's watching me. He's very proud of what I'm doing. In 1977, um, a group of older people, and by older, I was 16 at the time, and they were mid-20s, some into their 30s, but when you're 16, that's ancient. They all got together and said, let's go block the Gardner Expressway at Spadina. <laughs> and I said, okay. 
I went along with him. It was pretty cool because afterwards we'd all go over to this guy's house and he'd have beer and I was 60 and he's willing to give me a beer and let me be one of the boys. And that was one of our steps forward into manhood, I guess. We were on the highway for about 25 minutes when the um, patrol police showed up uh, in paddy wagons and other cars. They, they threw us into vehicles and they took us down to the police station. Now, I'm 16 years old. There's no such thing as the Young Offender Act at the time, so I'm treated just like an adult. They held us in that cop station for 60 days. They didn't take us to the jail. They kept us in their holding cells for 60 days. At 3 o'clock every morning, they would come and soak you with a fire hose. Now, you only have a set of clothes to wear, so you would be taking off those clothes every morning and hanging them on the bars trying to get the dry. Every night they would do the same thing. They beat us regularly and daily. And I saw some of the toughest men I know cry. I don't want to say they took it easy on me, but I think they did. The big thing they did to me was they came up and they put a football helmet on my head and they handcuffed me to a chair with wheels and they pushed me to a flight of stairs and down that flight of stairs. That was my introduction at activism by choice. See, prior to that, I went with family to rallies and, and, and blockades and whatever was going on in North America. This one I chose to go to. A week after we were arrested and we were still being held in the cop station, the Pig Farmers Association of Canada, or Ontario, sorry, blocked that very same piece of highway and they opened up the doors and they let the pigs go free on the, on the QBW and they received national sympathy while we were in jail. I asked myself one time, what do I stand for? And that's not an easy question. When you ask yourself that, you truly ask yourself that, you do a lot of soul searching. Everything written about me in the last 15 years has been, he's an environmentalist. And I'm not. I've never professed to be. I was kind of pushed into the position. <coughs> I came to the conclusion that I'm a social justice activist. And we all define that in our own ways, but in my way, it means what's good for you is good for me, or it's not good for anybody. You can't have elitism. You can't have the Rob Fords or the Mike Duffies or the other things that are going on today. And let's take those out. Two years ago was another big scandal. Two years before that was another big scandal. Two years before that was another big scandal. The people at the top just seem to be immune to anything. I made conscious decisions in my life because I understood the outcomes. I knew in the back of my mind when I went to block the Gardner Expressway that the potential to get arrested was there, and I did it anyways. And I've probably done about two and a half years of jail time at 60 day increments for blockades and rallies and this and that and the other thing. It's a decision I made. And I'm comfortable with that decision. I don't regret a minute of those decisions. I talk a lot to students, and I see professors sitting back in their rooms, and they're pointing to their students on CBC getting arrested. That's my students out there, you see. When I taught at Trent, I asked my class, why did you sign up to take my class? And they said, because while you're teaching us, you're on CNN. You're in Men's Health. You're in Time Magazine. You're in all of these things. I do stuff. I don't talk about that stuff. I do it. And I do it because it needs to be done. And I'm looking into a room of head shaking because you all chose to come here, which tells me you do it. You don't talk about doing it. You do it. And there's a difference in the world between doers and talkers. But I have in my pocket a status card. And that status card says I can go anywhere in North America, anywhere in the British Commonwealth, and they cannot stop me. I can be running from a bank robbery across the border in Windsor, 
into Detroit and they can't stop me. They can give me a hard time, but they can't stop me. So I made the decisions to do the things that I did in my life because I know it's not going to impact me. But it will impact you. See, if you're 17 or 18 or 20 years old and you decided to go block a road and you got arrested, 30 years from now you get that dream promotion and you've got to do a lot of travel and the U.S. says, well, you're not allowed in here. And the U.K. says, you're not allowed in here. And the Eurozone says, you're not allowed in here. You just screwed yourself because of a decision you made 30 years ago. Because you weren't properly informed. And now you are. I make these decisions to do these things in my life because they need to be done. I opened up a medical supply company and I ran that company for quite a few years. I was very successful in what I did in the medical supply business because I was a registered Aboriginal business with the United Nations. I did business with the war in Iraq, I did business with the Marines, I did business with the Coast Guard. I did pretty good business. And then I decided to block a road in Armstrong. And for six and a half weeks, I didn't go to work. I don't want to tell you how much it costs my business, but when I <coughs> service your clients for a month and a half, they go elsewhere. I don't regret a damn thing that I've done. My wife will tell you that was a very difficult time for us, but she stood behind me. We blocked that road for six and a half weeks, and we were the first people to take a stand against Chemical Valley ever. We heard there was some problems down in Burnt Church. A bunch of us jumped into camper vans, and we drove down to Burnt Church, and there we were. And then we were told there were some issues up in Shoshone Reds about uranium, so we all jumped in vans, and we headed down to, to Nevada. In Oregon, we spearheaded a bunch of changes that happened within the city of Oregon to address indigenous issues because they shot a gun through our sweat lodge and the police refused to investigate it. I don't hesitate to do these things because that's activism. I don't understand idle no more because I don't remember a period in my life where I was ever idle. <laughs> I don't understand because the people that I know, and I understand we all see the world from a different perspective, but the people I know are much like me, much like you, which has never been idle. So it should be a reawakening, not an idle no more. I was involved in three international bridge blockades through Island no more. The Amgenau Rail blockade, the march through London, Ontario, where we shut down the city of London. I was in six different rallies in Ottawa, two here in Toronto. That was all in December and January. What I saw this year has been the most fulfilling year of a lifetime of activism. People are getting it. People are getting it everywhere. In the smallest, most remote corners of Australia, New Zealand, the UK, people are getting it. When we did the blockade, I had pictures on my Facebook of people from around the world who were holding up signs saying, you know, Venezuela's I don't know more, and the UK is I don't know more. And it, 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 I've never had such a satisfying year. I use the expression tapped by the Creator. I've been tapped by the Creator so many times. I'm so blessed for what has happened to me in my life and where I am. Two things are, are, are shining brightly on me as I ride off in the sunset here. The issue with CN is huge and weighing. Um, they want to find me $180,000 to $200,000 for blocking a piece of land that I own. It's part of Ogden. And I'm willing to take it on because CN made a mistake. 
There's probably a million websites out there with information on Ron Plain, and I don't say that to be egotistical or to brag, it just is what it is. And I read through these things and I see and I say to myself, who in CM really thought that I would tuck tail in Ron? It's just not in me. They could have gone to any one of 150 or 200 people that are on video and in pictures. In the paper that you guys put out today, uh, we're on the back page of it. None of these people are charged with contempt only. How bad did they do their research on me to think that I'm going to just take it from <clears throat> I'll close off real quick with, with um, the teaching. It's a teaching that was given me when I was very, very young. I'm a really bad artist, so I'm not going to try to draw it, but you all know what a maple leaf looks like. If you were to hold your maple leaf up and it was your hand, then the main stem of the maple leaf is what we call the red road. That's the path the Creator has laid out for everyone. We start here and we end here. But I'm an idiot. I don't take the direct path. So I thought I could sing and I hung around and did a little bit of that rock and roll stuff. So I went over here and I drank and I used and I partied too much. And when I learned my lessons from that, I went back down to the red road and I went up a little bit more and I got a little vein and I went off on that path on it and I come back down and then I go up and I go up on this path and all of these paths that you see on the maple leaf are the lessons in life that you had to learn. And I used that, it was given to me to, to uh, bring comfort or, or closure. I, I, I spent a period of my life in the children's aid and, and it wasn't fun. Um, so I used that bring closure in this way, and that the person or people who did what they did, they're over here still. They're never going to get back on that path until they realize what they've done is wrong. So if I abuse my wife, I'm stuck over here until I learn that that's not a way to be. It may take this life or next life or the next life. I'm stuck here and never going to reach where I'm supposed to go until that. I don't want to say that I'm coming to an end only because I, I, I want to be here for another 50 years or so. But this is coming to an end. This is my last speaking engagement. I carry uh, anger for meetings here. I'm in a meeting with a uh, minister of the environment. Blah, 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 and I can't reach across the table and teach the man a lesson. So I have to swallow that anger. And then I go and I meet with the Petrochemical Association, and they say, blah, 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 and I carry that anger because I can't say it. And then I come here, and you guys didn't earn this anger, man. You're the choir. You're the people that feed me my juice. I can't give you that anger. So I take that anger with me out of here. In March, I. Uh, both almost paralyzed. And I had uh, herniated discs in my neck, and everybody can point to all the medical reasons why that exists, and the elders that's got nothing to do with that. It's because you have this anger carrying right here. She can see it as clearly as she can see the shirt that I'm wearing. And it made sense to me what she said. I saw her yesterday, and she said, Man, you look light. <laughs>
quick too. Uh, we raised almost $650 last night. Oh, and yeah. for people who haven't had a chance to donate, I'm just going to pass these to Bradley and pass them around. So now we're going to welcome uh, John Bell, who's on the editorial board with a socialist worker and the columnist for the much-loved Left Jeff. <laughs> what an honor it is. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, truly an honor for me to be speaking together with, uh, with Ron, whose work I've been following for a long time and for whom I have the utmost respect. The other thing that I want to do right off the bat is remind everybody in the launch that we're having this meeting on unceded First Nations land, land that uh, belongs to the, uh, the Mississauga and the Grand River that does not belong to us. Besides thanking Ron, I want to thank Stephen Harper. Because in a way, Stephen Harper has brought us together in a way that we haven't been brought together for, really, for a generation. The attacks that Stephen Harper has made on First Nations people, those are the attacks that have engendered the rise of the Iron War. Those attacks, and I'll outline what some of them mean, are, at, 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 as we go through this, evidence of how important it is for Stephen Harper and for his corporate masters, and remember who's the fiddler and who calls the tune here. Stephen Harper is the fiddler, but we know that it is the corporate agenda, big oil, resource extraction, big mining, those are the people that call the, call the tune. We know what their agenda is, and it's absolutely imperative that they destroy the rights of First Nations people in this country to get what they're after. That's what the first thing that we actually absolutely have to do. This is an imperial project, an imperialist project. And everything that we need to know about fighting against this has to begin with the understanding of, 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 of what an imperialist, imperialist project means for people like Harper. Why it is imperative for them to bring about the uh, eradication of First Nations cultures. Yes, the assimilation. Harper, years ago, apologized for Canada's disgusting practice of earlier in the century, at the end of the 19th century, the residential schools. A hollow, hypocritical, disgusting apology. We know that everything that he has done since then is in the same vein of, of, of assimilation, cultural genocide. Those are the things that Stephen Harper wants to bring about. So his apology, I have. I don't imagine that Ron or anybody else really accepted much of, uh, in the way of that apology. We know, for instance, that one of the things that came out of the, the, uh, the uh, examination of that, uh, that history of the residential schools was the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one of the things that it was supposed to do was set up an archive, a resource for First Nations people and for other people to go back and examine that history learn that history. Part of the healing that we would need to see is a full airing, a full exposure of what exactly that meant. The murders, the beatings, taking over 150,000 young people from, from Aboriginal families, destroying those families. So generation, generations, not just one generation, generations of families. It, it, it always amazes me that in spite of all of this, in spite of these crimes, how resilient, how powerful, and how strong First Nations cultures are, because they're still there. They're still uh, people who are, are proudly uh, holding on to the cultures that the Canadian state, the ruling uh, powers, have done everything absolutely in their power to destroy the break. <laughs> That, that connection still remains. They have to do this because, as I say, 
They want to move the Canadian economy to become the Saudi Arabia of the 21st century. Those are Harper's words. Uh, the energy superpower of the 21st century. And they know that what they're out to do, what the, and their economic project is, is a project that is racing towards extinction. They know that the 21st century is not going to be a century of fossil fuels. Well, if it continues to be, we won't have a 22nd century. They know that the time is limited for them to get the tar sands out, to extract the, the, uh, the dirtier and, uh, and more uh, energy intensive fossil fuels that they need to extract. So they have to rush headlong. It's, it, they, they honestly, these are, these are people, I mean, it's difficult for us to put ourselves in, in their mindset, but these are people who believe that if they leave the tar in the ground, that they are irresponsible. They are irresponsible. They don't gouge it out as fast as possible. They know what it does to the world. They know that in gouging it out, they destroy the environment and the land locally to produce products which, by their use, destroy the environment and the land globally, and us along with it. But, you know, there are people like Rex Tillerson. Maybe people saw this quote. Rex Tillerson is the CEO of ExxonMobil, and they had their corporate meeting last week. And Rex Tillerson actually said, what good is it to save the planet if humanity suffers? He actually said that if we deprive humanity of the benefits of fossil fuels and the profits that come from them, he's, I think he, maybe he's thinking, defining humanity very narrowly uh, as you know, ExxonMobil shareholders. But that is the thinking, that's the logic of our enemy. That's the logic of the Stephen Harpers. That's the logic. It's the same logic. Remember when they were debating whether or not to uh, to uh, make the deal with uh, uh, the uh, in the uh, oil patch in the uh, tar sands with the Chinese National Overseas Oil Company, Nexus, the, the, the Nexus deal, and one of the spokespeople for the uh, the Chinese National Overseas Oil Company talked about under the, the danger of underdeveloping tar sands. And he said, it's the same situation as the leftover single women. It will be the same for the tar sands. They will be outdated just like unmarried single women. This is a mindset that is, I hope, very difficult for us to wrap up. <laughs> but you don't have to dig very far find this evidence. You don't have to dig very far to find out what it is they think and what they think of us. Because that's the bottom line. What do they think of us, if they think of us at all? We're, we are resources to be used and tossed away just like the shit that they want to gouge out of the ground. Just like, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the mentality that a, a, a tree is worth nothing if it's not sawed down and sliced into, into uh, planks. That kind of mindset. So, we thank them, in a way, for fueling us in that. And I'm somebody who is motivated by two things. I'm motivated by the kind of anger that Ron has talked about. When I see the way they approach the world, the way they approach it, Humanity, the way they approach First Nations, women, you name it, and the way they use cynically oppression to divide us, to conquer us. They know what they're doing. They do these things on purpose. They foster sexism. They foster racism. They foster divisions. This is what they do. And that is their aim to make sure that we don't come together because our coming together in places like this around movements like I don't know more. That is their worst nightmare. So let's give it to them. <laughs> if, if, I, if I can make three main things uh, clear through this, it's that 
It is the land, broadly speaking, the environment, we call it the environment. But for First Nations people, when they talk about the land and their connection to the land, this is one of the things that I, I, I hope I'm coming to understand, is that they're not just talking about land the way we talk about land, or, you know, it's not an acre, it's not a patch, it's not a thing I own. It is, it's something much more deep, holistic, and uh, it, it involves, it, it, it's more like what we think about when we talk about the environment. It's everything together. It's the land. It's the things on the land, the living things, and the things that we have been taught to think of as inanimate. All of these things together. The attack on First Nations is an attack on the, on the environment. And I don't know if I would be too upset by being called an environmentalist. I think there's a lot worse things to be called. But we have to understand that the attack on the environment is not a separate thing. It is a, it, it intrinsically connected to attack all of the rest of the attacks that we see uh, against us. The other thing, that, the next thing I want to make sure that we all walk away from uh, this understanding is that in the fight against Harper, First Nations people, their organizations, their activity has to be absolutely and fully in the leadership of what we are going to do. You know, Harper has been attacking everybody. Everybody. Whatever your constituency, unless you're part of, that one, of the 1%, maybe then you haven't been, uh, you know, uh, too much attacked. But everybody else has been attacked. And we see, we see people popping up here and struggle locally. We see people popping up there and struggle locally. But what is the force that has come out in, in the time that Harper has been in office and made the most impact? Occupy, important. Uh, the, the Quebec students, absolutely you know, crucial. But I have one more as a national response to the attacks of the Stephen Harper agenda is crucial. And we haven't seen a lot of, you know, and I mean, there seems to have been a little bit of down, downturn for people who don't know what, how to watch and how to see around Idle No More. It just means that Idle No More is maybe not this week in the streets blockading a bridge, blockading a, a, a rail line or whatever, uh, demonstrating in, in vast numbers in Ottawa. But it means that Idle No More is talking in communities, in First Nations communities, talking in places like this, where First Nations people come together with activists from other stories. It's absolutely important that we acknowledge how important Idle No More is and the leadership of First Nations people. And it's not the kind of, uh, uh, we have to also recognize that. We're not talking about alliances of convenience. We're talking about the fact that in order to really address our concerns, my concern for the environment cannot be addressed unless it completely takes into account that justice for First Nations people has to be part of it. It has to be a, an environmentalism that is anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-ableist. It has to bring together everybody. That's the nightmare. That's the nightmare that we want them to have. And finally, and, I, and this is not, a, not a, a, a criticism, but First Nations people cannot win alone. They can win important things. I mean, if, if, you know, if nobody allies with with uh, First Nations people and, and I don't know more, they'll still win important things. Reforms here, concessions there, but the big fight, the big struggle that we all share can't be won by any one group alone. It means that we all have to come together. How we come together or don't, how we organize or don't, these are the crucial questions. Um, and these are questions that uh, that Harper and his friends, yeah, they think about it. Tom Flanagan thinks about them. You remember Tom Flanagan? I mean, before his disgrace, he was uh, the Stephen Harper's number one pit bull 
when it came to attacking First Nations people. He was the hit man. He wrote the, you know, the crappy book on how to, uh, you know, on just what was wrong with those, those First Nations people. If only they could get their head around private property. You know, that would solve everything. If only they would get on the bandwagon. That would solve everything. Anyway. In 2009, Flanagan wrote a very interesting uh, document called Resource Industries and Security Issues in Northern Alberta. It was for the Canadian Defense and Foreign Affairs Institute, a think tank. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in it, in it, I'm going to read a fairly long quote. Um, the rapid expansion of, res of, nat of natural resource industries in Northern Alberta accompanied by growing environmentalist and aboriginal rights movements, raises issues of possible extra-legal and even violent re resistance to industrial development. Five potential sources of opposition can be identified. Individual saboteurs, eco-terrorists, mainstream environmentalists, and let's remember that thanks to <laughs> uh, people like uh, Joe Oliver, we know that my mainstream environmentalists now are eco-terrorists, but anyway, we'll let that go. Uh, First Nations and the Métis people. These are the five obstacles that they've identified. I would add a few more obstacles, but nonetheless, that, that's what uh, Tom Flanagan's concerned about. If these, come, uh, if these groups come together all of, uh, by using a combination of litigation, blockades, occupations, boycotts, sabotage, and violence against economic development projects, which they saw as a threat to the environmental values or aboriginal rights, that would become a huge danger. If two or more of those five categories of people described above, and this is Flanagan's quote, came together in a single movement, they could become a serious obstacle to development. And I say, amen, let's do that. Let us really <laughs> do exactly what Tom Flanagan thinks worries that we're going to do. He says it can't happen. He says that, 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 that never the twain shall meet, that we have a different agenda, that we don't understand First Nations people, that there are serious divisions within First Nations, and all of these things, divisions between us and First Nations people, divisions within First Nations, those are going to keep us apart. And they're going to keep us apart, in part, because Flanagan, Harper, and their bill are going to do everything they can to exacerbate those divisions. We have to fight back. When they try that, that kind of division, divide and conquer, we have to remember how important it is that we come together. And we come together seriously and honestly on a, a level of, of equality, not a, a, a level of, of convenience, but a deeper level than that. The attacks, legislative attacks. Let's just talk about this for a minute. There's legislation on the table from the Tories to abolish the Indian Act. A two-edged sword, the Indian Act. On the one hand, it has been a, a, you know, a tool of oppression for First Nations people. But in a curious sort of way, the Indian Act, along with treaties and, and uh, legal uh, agreements that have been arrived at between uh, First Nations and, and uh, uh, the uh, Canadian state have become and tactically things that need to be defended because there is within that the Indian Act, and believe me, Harper wants to get rid of the Indian Act completely. And it's not, I mean, I know lots of First Nations people who want to get rid of the Indian Act completely, but they're not talking about the same thing when they talk about those, those things. Harper wants to get rid of the Indian Act so he can get on with his project of assimilation, of destruction. First Nation people want to get rid of the, the, the racist uh, and colonial history, baggage of the, of the Indian Act. Strategically, we want to get rid of the Indian Act. Tactically, there's things there, there that actually need to be defended because they can be used against Harper <coughs> and, uh, and his ilk. There's legislation on, that, on the table that is going to uh, bring uh, essentially force First Nations people um, to uh, uh, adopt the, 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 uh, the right to buy and sell private property. 
a movement up for basically, you know, the, uh, the idea that this is a freedom, this is, this is a right, uh, that everybody should have the right to, to buy and sell private property. One of First Nations people, one of, whom, one of the things that we need to, to, to acknowledge is that there were probably people in, uh, in, in a, a lot of First Nations who would be happy to go along with that. But overall, it means the destruction of collective democracy, collective decision making, thinking about the stewardship of the land that is part of everybody's responsibility, not just the, uh, you know, the, 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 the individual. The more important pieces of legislation, the omnibus budget bills that have been brought up, C-38, C-45, these are, are legislations that cut to the very core of First Nations right. They're uh, basically one of the, oh, these are, are obstacles to, uh, to uh, you know, it's the kind of red tape argument we've heard so much. These are obstacles to, you know, just to good business practices. Um, the right, for instance, of individuals, say uh, an elected band uh, council, the right for them to lease mineral rights to a corporation. Pre previous to Bill C-48, that was a difficult thing to do because the, the, you know, the, the, uh, there were a, a number of mechanisms involved. If, a, if a, uh, a First Nation was considering such a thing, they had to have a meeting, they had to have a quorum, they had to be consulted, there had to be real discussions and understanding within the First Nations. And there was a, you know, a, a, when those kinds of informed discussions happen, many times those leases are just turned down because of the environmental impacts of the world. Well, that's gone through Bill C-38. And Tom Flanagan, he thinks that's a good idea. Tom Flanagan said, these amendments do not force First Nations to do anything. They only make it easier for those who want to lease the land to do so. And only leasing is involved. The rules governing sale of reserve land remains unchanged. Weasel words. We know what it means. It means an erosion of, of collective uh, uh, decision making uh, for First Nations. The Inavitable Waters uh, Act, the, the, uh, the, the destruction, essentially the fact that before, before this bill, any corporation that wanted to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Navigable Waters Act essentially protected uh, uh, lakes, rivers in, in, in this country. When somebody wanted to do a mega, mega project, the old legislation meant that in, immediately they had to do an environmental assessment and there had to be consultation, consultation with First Nations people. Now, after the Omnibus Act, that's gone. 99.7% of Canada's lakes and 99.9% .9 of Canada's rivers are now exempt. If a corporation wants to do a, a, a major mega project that impacts that water, they don't have to do an environmental assessment anymore. And they don't have to consult First Nations people. That cuts to the core. That cuts to the core. No wonder the Canadian state and harbor has done everything they, ha they can for the, the last number of years to keep the United Nations rapporteur on the rights of indigenous people out of this country. A shameful, shameful record. How we come together, and I'm gonna just end on this, how we come together has to be uh, uh, something that we discuss together, uh, but it's very, very crucial. I wanna end by quoting somebody who I've had the pleasure of speaking with in the past, one of a new generation, nothing wrong with the old generation, but there's a wonderful new generation of activists, speakers, people like Clayton Thomas Mueller, Ben Powers, Heather Milton Lightning, people who are, uh, Leanne Simpson, absolutely fantastic young people who are speaking out. One of the things that Clayton wrote Clayton Thomas Mueller, in a most recent art, uh, edition of uh, Canadian Dimension is, that what I learned in all my environmental battles was that unique priority rights, the fiduciary obligations governments have to North Native Indians, the Native Americans, defined by our sacred treaties, trust relationships, and other unique legal instruments, like the Indian Act, like it or not, 
Native Americans and First Nations peoples have an important tool. We are the keystones in a hemispheric social movement strategy that could end the era of big oil and eventually usher in another paradigm from this current destructive time of free market economics. Essentially, he's describing the building of a grassroots coalition that can challenge not just the oil industry, but capitalism itself. And I want to really end with a quote from Karl Marx when he talks about the, the, the origin of, of, of capitalism in, in the, his great work, Capital. He said, the discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in mines of the Aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skin, signaled the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. Remember that capitalism, which is what we're talking about here, it's not Harper, it's capitalism. Harper is just the poster boy. Capitalism is based on the theft of First Nations land, the cultural and actual genocide of First Nations people, the legacy of slavery. These are the things that are not accidental or casually uh, attached to capitalism. These are things which it has at its root. And although they try and uh, put a happier face on capitalism these days, quotes like I mentioned from the, uh, the CEO of uh, ExxonMobil remind us that their mindset has not changed in the slightest. Thank you.